Okay, so this is called the 13 Colonies Forum. We're going to take it back to Jamestown for just a little bit to kind of establish uh, some things that we left out in the previous video. So Jamestown is really the first English attempt, first successful attempt by the English to settle here. Um, and they're very successful, many thanks to uh, tobacco, basically their cash crop. But the settlers, after they had been successful for a while, felt like they weren't really well representative, especially in a government. Their, their voices weren't being heard. So the Virginia Company decided that the Burgesses, all right, the Burgesses, which are the elected representatives, would meet once per year, and this would be called the House of Burgesses. And it was the first official uh, self-representation or self-representative government in, uh, in the colony. So the House of Burgesses, that's important to know. There were other examples that we talked about in the previous video that kind of give rise to democratic ideals, such as the things we find in the, the Pilgrim colonies and uh, the Massachusetts Bay colony. We have... You know, the, the Mayflower Compact, and then we have the uh, church that is led by the people as opposed to the minister. So that's kind of where we're at. So now that all these colonies are forming, we're going to start to see a rise in more established and larger areas. Uh, and one of the first areas that kind of grows out of this is the New England colonies. And many people were living in the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and many people disagreed with the Puritans that ran the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So they started to leave, and they formed their own colonies. All right. So Roger Williams left, uh, and a lot of people were banished. They didn't just leave voluntarily. A lot of them were banished. And he formed Rhode Island because of what he disagreed with the Puritans. Um, he disagreed with a lot of the views that they thought uh, were, were important to Puritan ideals. So Roger Williams left. Rhode Island, found, uh, Rhode Island was founded by Roger Williams. I just really messed that up, so hopefully you got that. All right. Anne Hutchinson also left because she challenged the Puritan way of life, and she fled to Rhode Island. She, was kind, of, she kind of moved all, the, all around, all over the place. But the Puritans were very intolerant of Quakers, which is very ironic because they felt like they were being persecuted back home in England. So you would think that they would know how that felt, but they hated what the Quakers stood for because they stood for equality, all right? and they, they stood for religious tolerance. And that, that challenged the Puritan way of life. So Puritans began to execute Quakers, and Mary Dyer, who we're going to read about later, uh, stood against the uh, Puritan ways, and she was executed for her beliefs. And, and she really felt that her execution, her hanging, would uh, end the conflict between the Puritans and the Quakers, and in some ways it kind of did. So, um, so New England, it's going to continue to grow. By the 1650s, settlers had spread all over the area. Uh, the New England area it was very, very populated. It was largely kind of the same types of people with big, large religious groups. Uh, but you had a lot of religious groups popping up, you know, Puritans, Baptists, all sorts of stuff. So the people of New England thrived off of exploiting the region's resources, such as the sea. So you had harbors, fishing, trading, stuff like that. The forest, knocking them down for timber, building ships out of them, building homes out of them. The land, you know, for very little farming there was, mainly more so for, you know, kind of the timber, I guess. And they began to export these resources and made money off of it. They traded off of it. They exit it out, you know, export it out, import things in or export it out, and, and sell it for its profit. So Britain felt like, hey, you know, we own all of you guys, and we should be getting money of this. So they passed the Navigation Acts, which were the first series of acts um, passed by England to make sure they benefited from the exports that were being taken out of New England. So New England was selling all these goods and making all this money, but England was saying, look, you either need to sell directly to us trade directly with us or pay us a little bit of money. It was all part of that mercantilism society that we talked about in class. Okay, so the New England colonies pushed out um, the Native Americans and attracted a lot of different types of immigrants over time. And they shifted to a commerce and business-driven society. They got away from the land so much and really became industries. And that's why you have a lot of big cities up there. Uh, and, and Puritan control was declining. Right? Puritan control really was declining. Um, so here are, the, here are the four colonies you have in the, in the New England colonies to make up the 13. Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. Maine did exist, but it's technically owned by Massachusetts. So when you label your map, you are going to label Maine, but you're going to put an asterisk beside it and say that it is owned by Massachusetts. So now we move on down to the southern colonies. All right? So the southern colonies were kind of the colonies... Uh, Virginia and below. So we haven't gone through the middle colonies yet. So Maryland was founded as a place where Catholics could escape religious persecution, um, and it deepened and it depended on tobacco farming uh, for a living. So that's kind of unique to Maryland. The Carolinas were created to offer religious freedom for lots of people and also lots of land to future settlers. We had a big chunk of area that hadn't been claimed yet here. Many large farms and plantations kind of began to rise up in South Carolina and North Carolina, and they used slaves to work the land and to grow crops such as tobacco, rice, 
and uh, you know many other things. And this eventually spreads out through the entire southern population, up into Virginia and down into Georgia and further on. So colonists in North Carolina eventually rebelled and said, hey, we want our own representative government. We don't want to be the Carolinas. And so North Carolina and South Carolina separated into royal colonies in 1729. So you have North and South Carolina now. Georgia was originally created as a buffer between the Spanish in Florida and then South Carolina, kind of like, hey, don't bother us, we won't bother you. And it was also an area where people who were really in debt or really poor could go and try to start a new life, start over, if you will. So you have your five colonies here, Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, and Georgia. And as, as I said before, they became very dependent on slave labor and plantations. Plantations are going to rise and spread up all through the south, and not just in these colonies, but down into the deep south of Alabama and stuff like that, Missouri, uh, Mississippi. But it's the plantation owners who were considered the elite here with all the money. All right, and earlier in the in New England colonies, is the one you know maybe running the businesses, the trading, the merchants, and stuff like that. And the colonies is the one that owns the farms. So the last board here are the middle colonies, and this area had a very diverse population and a very diverse, uh, meaning very diverse ethnic population and a very diverse religious population. All sorts of uh, people lived in this area. So initially much of this area was settled by the Dutch, but eventually England took over, as we very well know, and William Penn, who was a Quaker, founded the colony of Pennsylvania. Um, and Quakers believed in religious freedom and equality, which I mentioned earlier, and the one unique thing about Quakers that's important to note is that they were against slavery. They condemned it. All right, So they were full of successful farms, not as big as plantations, but they did have some good fertile soil in that area and a lot of harbors to make money. So a lot of sea trading and uh, fishing and stuff like that to make some money. Philadelphia is one of the fastest growing cities due to trading and uh, New York was close behind. So they traded a lot for what they had. A lot of skilled artisans in this area, so craftspeople, uh, woodworkers, uh, iron workers, whatever the case was back then. And then New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware are your four middle colonies. So eventually all of these are going to form to make the United States of America. We'll continue to add states and colonies and all sorts of stuff, but this is where it all starts, the 13 original colonies.